Um, Padre, th thank you very much for joining me. Um, book was fantastic. Finish it off there last week. Um, you might get us going by giving us a bit of an an idea of your background and kind of the purview of the book, like what what was and wasn't uh, within the scope of it. Um, well, I suppose my background is I have a PhD in modern Irish history and I have a BA in archaeology. Um, I have written uh, seven books on the War of Independence period, the Civil War, the 1916 Rising. And as I was researching those, I started coming across the phenomenon of what's called the, the disappeared. Um, now, when we talk about the disappeared in Irish history and politics, your listeners will be very familiar with or your viewers would be very familiar with the more recent disappeared in the north people like um Jean McConville, Columba McVeigh, Robert Nyrak and so on whose bodies um in, in some cases like Nyrak and Columba McVeigh those bodies are, are still missing um but what people don't tend to realize is that a phenomenon was actually happening in the 1920s as well and it was actually far more common then and even going right back as far as the uh the 1798 rising there were disappearances happening and i suppose when we talk about forced disappearances you said what is and isn't covered in the book um basically the term forced disappearances is used talking about people around the world and it's a global phenomenon who have been disappeared for um uh, political uh, or military reasons and their bodies deliberately hidden after after execution after they've been killed. So if we take some place like the um, the Spanish um, Civil War in the 1930s, you had an estimated quarter of a million people disappeared there. Uh, many of those bodies are um, are still missing or only being recovered in the uh, the modern day, and that's a hugely controversial thing in Spanish politics. If you talk about, um, let's say the the Middle East, the recent um, uh, uh, the recent civil war in Syria, Amnesty International estimates that there were about um, seventy thousand people disappeared as a result of that conflict, and again, many of those bodies haven't haven't been found. We think of South America and we think of um, General uh, Pinochet's um, uh, dictatorship in Chile. And uh, what you had there was, you know, about 2000 people who were being um, disappeared as well, opponents of the political regime. And um, in some cases, actually, it's funny when you see soccer players, particularly from South America or Spanish speaking countries scoring, um, they will often pull off their shirt and pull it up over their head to celebrate after they've they've scored a goal. And that originally began as kind of a silent protest against people who had been disappeared by Pinochet's regime that had bags put over their head and were never uh, seen again. Yeah. Um, so if we look at Irish history, um, the numbers are not as large as things happening in Spain or Syria and other places. Um, for 1798, we do know what was happening, but our records aren't, aren't as good and we don't know precisely how many people were even killed in that rebellion, let alone disappeared. Um, if we talk about the War of Independence and Civil War period, we can be much more accurate. We know that during the um, Irish Revolution, if we call it that, you're talking about uh, 115 people being disappeared by the so-called good old IRA. Some of those were in the Civil War, some of them were in the truce period. The majority, about 94, 95 of them, would be disappeared by the IRA in the War of Independence. And of course, who was commanding that army? It was Michael Collins, Richard Mulcahy, Eamon de Valera, people who kind of went on to become, uh, become statesmen. So 95 people being disappeared by the, the old IRA or sometimes the good old IRA as they're being called in the, the South to differentiate them from the more recent um, incarnations of the IRA, be it the provisionals or whoever. Um, you're talking about the provisional IRA disappearing just under 20 people in approximately 30 years of the Troubles. So when you compare that to three years of the War of Independence and close to 100 people being killed. The, you know, the people who founded the modern Irish state in the South were disappearing people at a far more um, alarming rate than the, uh, the the provisionals later did. I didn't know the number. I, I knew about the the babies who, who tragically never kind of never got to live past a very, very early age from the laundries and the and those different homes. 
But uh, you pointed out in the book that that figure is about nine thousand. They're not they're not included, you know, as like as these kind of political disappearances. Yeah. I'm 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 specifically looking, and again, other people have asked me about missing women in Ireland and serial killers. I'm not interested in it. Let's say it's not a book about about crime per se. It's about Irish history, politics, and military history. And yeah, the largest number of um, people who are hidden, who were disappeared, whose bodies are in mass graves, will be in places like the um, the tomb laundry in, in Galway. And that would have been infants who died and who were buried by either, you know, the Sisters of Mercy or Good Shepherd Sisters or whatever Catholic institutions. And it's important to say as well, when we talk about Magdalene laundries and, and mother and baby homes, they were set up prior to independence and actually they were Protestant run what run um baby homes and mother and child homes as well. But we don't tend to talk about them as, as much. But the focus of this book is 1798, the War of Independence and the more recent troubles. Well, if we talk briefly, maybe first about um 1798 and we have a very kind of romanticized view of that of that rebellion and we think of it as these huge pitched battles between these poorly armed rebels and these you know um you know british crown forces huge regiments of them we have to realize that in, in any campaign intelligence gathering spying is going to be hugely uh hugely important and um in 1798, the United Irishmen and the defenders, the, the rebels, were um, pretty brutal when it came to dealing with suspected British spies and informers. So, for example, there was a Catholic priest, Father Michael Phillips, who had been active in Roscommon, and he was gathering intelligence information for the uh, for the British, for Dublin Castle. And the defenders, who were the local rebel organisation there, found out what he was up to. He fled to Belfast and they followed him to Belfast and assassinated him there. And I mean, we would think, oh, Irish Republicans would never, you know, kill or assassinate a priest no matter what he had done in 1795, 98, they would. Um, August 1795 in Whitlow, you have a guy called William McCormack. He's an agent for Dublin Castle. Again, he's been gathering um, information and a group of about 200 United Irish men called his house, drag him out of his home cut off his ears, cut off his nose, and then kill him by decapitating him and cut all his limbs off. Um, so again, pretty brutal treatment of, of people who were suspected of, of being informers. Um, if we talk about disappearances, that was happening then as well. There was a guy called John Newell. He was from Downpatrick in, in County Down in the north. He had been a member of the United Irishmen in 1796. He was turned in 1797 and went King's Evidence. He testified against 200 United Irishmen who were captured in prison. Some of them were, were killed. And he was paid about £2,000, a huge sum of money in that day for, for that work. Um, he wasn't sensible enough to take the money and leave. He kept hanging around Belfast. He decided he was going to make even more money by publishing kind of a, a tell-all book Um. I mean, we can't imagine somebody like Steak, Steak Knife hanging around to write their own book and do book tours, but this is what Newell did. So unsurprisingly, he was um, abducted by the United Irishmen. He was executed and he's buried at a bridge near Temple Patrick in Count, County Antrim, and his body is still there. And um, I'll give you maybe one last example. Um, in 1798, there is a... Uh, school teacher called McClure in uh, in County Antrim and he's gathering intelligence again or suspected of being a spy for the for the British. He's abducted by the United Irish men. He's never seen again. And then years later in the 1840s, there's people digging turf in the local area and they come across a skeleton and somebody says, oh, no, there's been a murder. And someone says, no, 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 no. It was always rumoured that this school teacher was buried in this area. This must be his remains. So digging up the disappeared was happening back then. And it's not just, I know all those cases I've given are, are mainly from the, the north and maybe one in Whitlow. But if you look at Cork, there's a place near Clannacilty in West Cork, the soldiers field. Two British soldiers were captured there at the time of the 1798 rebellion, executed, buried. Their bodies are still there. And even a guy called Pat Murphy from Yall, who joined the uh, in East Cork, who joined the, the South Cork militia. And um, he was abducted. He was executed and he was disappeared by being buried on a beach and his body was found the following year. Right. I, I was going to say, OK, so b before I forget, um, uh, speaking of discovering bodies um, in your research, you kind of had your own little Indiana Jones moment where uh, where you you actually dug something up. You, you might tell us about that. 
Yeah, again, archaeology, hence the uh, hence the background. Um, what happened was I wrote my first book in uh, 2009. Uh, it was called Blood and the Banner, and it was about the War of Independence in uh, in County Clare, which is my 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 home place. And um, as I was writing it, I went up to Milltown Malbay, which is where three of my my four grandparents would be would be from. Um, so I had good local connections, and people said, "Oh, I hear that you're you're writing a you're writing a book." Um, uh, on the, the 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 war of independence the tan war are you going to mention the soldier in the bog and i kept saying what what soldier in the bog what are you talking about and they said oh don't you know there was a british army soldier at the end of the war of independence he was seeing a local girl he went out to uh to visit her one day and the local ira unit came across him suspected he was a spy they interrogated him he wouldn't talk they shot him and he's still buried in drumbon bog in moy I said, well, this, this is amazing. But, you know, you hear a lot of rumours, a lot of tall tales and stories. I said, I got to check this out. So I met um, a local uh, farmer and he took me up and he actually showed me um, the spot where this uh, this soldier was reputed to be buried. There was actually a wooden cross marking the, the site. And I mentioned it in passing in my book. I, I wrote no more about it or thought no more about it until I was doing my PhD on the War of Independence. and then I. Um, found a document from the local IRA unit saying 11th of July 1921 we captured a British soldier in this area uh, he wouldn't give us any information we think he's a spy we executed him and buried him so I was like okay this definitely happened so I have historic confirmation of it it's not just some story I kept researching and then I found a list of British soldiers who had gone missing in Ireland in 1920. This had been sent by the British government to the new Free State Irish government. And they were trying to sort out how many of these guys were deserters who had run away from the British army, and that was the overwhelming majority, and how many were, um, how many had been actually captured by the IRA. And on that list, I found a name, the date matched the 11th of June, 1921, and the name of the soldier was Private George Duff Chalmers. He was from the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Scots in the British Army. So finally, I'd solved the, uh, the, the mystery. I contacted uh, PJ Donnan, who was the local um, farmer who had showed me where the burial place was. And I decided, look, we need to properly mark the grave, not out of any respect for the, the British soldier in that, as far as I'm concerned, my politics are Irish Republican. He, you know, should have died an old man in his bed in Scotland. He should never have come to Ireland except on holidays. But that wasn't the politics of the, the time. Um, but I just didn't want it as an archaeologist and just as, as a moral thing. I didn't want anyone to interfere with the grave or to build on it and, and so on. So I got a stone. Uh, I carved it with just simple inscription. His name, Private George Duff Chalmers, um, British soldier and the date. I left it on the grave. It took four of us about an hour to carry it into this remote spot in the bog, forestry and over fences and everything. And one of the guys who actually helped me to uh, to mark the spot was the grandson of one of the executioners, uh, interestingly enough. And um, we marked the spot, thought no more about it. I wrote up an article on it for History Ireland magazine, forgot about it. That was about 2012. Then come 2018 and um, uh, suddenly I get word there's going to be an excavation, the soldiers being being dug up. And what had happened was that this um, soldier's family, the Chalmers family back in Scotland, had been basically recording their family history and researching it. They found this guy's name on the family tree and said, who's this guy? I wonder what happened to him. They put the name into Google, up hot the story. They contacted the Commonwealth War Graves, the Commonwealth War Graves in Britain, contacted on Garda Síochána, the Irish police force in the south, and um, moves were then made in May of 2018 to excavate the body. And my information was accurate. Where we have placed the, the burial, the, the grave slab, the Garda came, flipped that over, dug down two feet, and exactly below it were the remains of Private Chalmers. Now, there was very little left of him. Um, there was basically his uniform was intact, his boots were intact, a few bone fragments, not much. His British Army cap badge. Um, but what was very interesting to me was the money was still in his pockets. His executioners had shot him. They had not robbed him. And um, that soldier's remains then were given a formal reburial by um, the British Ministry of Defence. In um, there was a British Army cemetery in uh, in Dublin, um, uh, Grange Gorman Military Cemetery, 
And the Chalmers family invited me along to that because they were very thankful um, that we had, you know, told the story, found the grave, you know, protected the grave site. And afterwards there was a meal and I sat down with the these two British Ministry of Defence guys and I pulled out a list of my research and I said, OK, well, here's the names of all the other missing soldiers. Um, you know, I know in particular where, you know, maybe a dozen of these bodies are specifically buried. Do you want to go and, you know, recover another one? And they were absolutely horrified. They were like, no, we, we don't want, you know, anything. This is nothing to do with us talk to the Commonwealth War Graves. I went to the Commonwealth War Graves, again, really embarrassed, seemed to want nothing to do with it. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We, we're not going looking for these guys. That's a matter for on Garda Shia And I went to one of the guards who'd been involved in excavating private Chalmers remains. And I said, look, I know exactly where the body of to within a quarter of an acre where another one of these bodies is um, uh, Private um, uh, George Robertson. Um, who was buried um, near Connolly in, in County Clare, again in, in Northwest Clare. And the guard just laughed at me and said, no, that's that's nonsense. I said, how can you say it's nonsense? You know, we've just yeah, we've just found a body I identified. So there seems to be a lack of political will in the south of Ireland to engage with this, to talk about it. And there's two reasons for that. Um, I suppose if you're looking at it from the British side of things, um, the British, I should say, the British Crown Forces, I'm going to be talking a lot about Republicans, but the book also disappears times, be it in 1798, 1916, War of Independence, and even in the more recent Troubles, when the British Crown Forces and British Loyalists disappeared people as well. Um, but from the British point of view, the British government has carefully crafted this image for the British public of the hero heroic noble Tommy of the First World War. And I do not want to talk about what British soldiers were doing in Ireland in the early 1920s. So they're quite happy for these bodies to remain where they are, as far as I can see, for political reasons. From the point of view of Southern um, Irish politicians or establishment politicians, if we call them that, in, in Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, they make... Um, a lot of political capital, uh, and sometimes rightly so, for uh, criticising Sinn Féin and the provisional IRA and, and so on. Um, and they will talk uh, every time there's an election, the name of Jean McConville or Columba McVeigh, people disappear by the provisionals in the north, they, they often come up. But they're very reticent to talk or even admit the fact that the so-called good old IRA, the people who founded the state, actually disappeared far more people. And um, in some cases, it is um, people who were actually, you know, founding members of these party. Richard Mulcahy was the um, chief of staff of the IRA during the War of Independence when the majority of these disappearances happened. And he was a founding member of Fine Gael. Um, and ultimately, as the chief of staff, the buck stopped with him. You know, there were reports he knew this was was happening. Um, in on the Fianna Fáil side of things, I mean, De Valera was the president of the Republic at the time. And um, afterwards, you know, letters came in and appeals after the ceasefire in 1921. He would have known that this was was happening as well. But it's very difficult for people in Fine Gael and uh, Fianna Fáil to uh, start, you know, making political capital out of the disappeared in the uh, in the north, those disappeared by the provisionals, if most of the bodies that are actually being recovered and returned are people who were disappeared by the founding fathers of the southern state in the 20s. You might go into the reason why some people um, are disappeared um, as opposed to uh, the, the, the most of the cases where... Um, if you want to kill a spy, the the actual public finding of a body and stuff, it, it, it's very powerful. It's almost as powerful as like the death itself, you know? Yeah. So if you're talking about the War of Independence, 1920, 2021, um, the IRA of that era uh, execute just under 200 civilians whom they accuse of spying. Now, less than 20 percent of those are disappeared. In most cases, as you say, the IRA execute them and they will put a uh, they will put a label on the body, something along the lines of spies and informers beware, convicted spy tried by the IRA. Um, very occasionally, they will also use the word tout 
And we often think of tout as a term being used more in the, the north in the 70s. It was used occasionally in the uh, in the 20s as well. But those bodies would be shot left on a roadside or in a public place. And the idea with doing that was to basically um, to enforce the rule that, look, the police are boycotted. You do not talk to them. You do not give them information. You do not associate with them. And it was very, uh, very effective. Um, in some cases, though, the, the IRA made decisions to um, disappear the bodies. And sometimes that was for um, practical reasons. It is very difficult to, under British law, to convict somebody of a killing or a murder if you do not have a body. So that's one practical reason for us to, to hide evidence of the, the crime as it would have been seen by the, the British. Another reason for it is to prevent reprisals. Uh, in the 1920s, a lot of the people who were disappeared are British soldiers, are uh, black and tans who were serving in, in Ireland, are regular Irish RIC constables as well. And um, if they shoot them and leave them on the roadside, there is a danger in some cases that the British will engage in reprisals, that they will go out, the British Crown forces will start burning down local houses, killing local Republicans and their, their families. So a way to get around this is in some cases by hiding the bodies. Now, if that is done, it creates an element of doubt in the minds of the British Crown forces, because if there is any possibility that this soldier, this black and tan, this RIC constable is still alive, if you engage in reprisals, you are endangering them. Another reason why, why people are, are disappeared sometimes is um, to create an element of doubt amongst the enemy intelligence network. So if you have civilians who are disappeared um, and are suspected to be part of a wider British intelligence or Crown Forces intelligence gathering agency, it once they vanish, it leaves the local Republicans the opportunity to basically start watching, seeing what are their friends doing? What are their family doing? What are the other suspected spies in the area doing? Are they panicking? Are they changing their behavior? And it gives you an opportunity to try and suss out, smoke out or net other people who would have been in that same uh, intelligence network. It's, there was one, I can't think of the name, but there was someone in the book who um, the IRA uh, accused and uh, accused him of being a spy, went shot and put a, a placard on him, but he actually didn't die. Uh, am, am I yeah, there's there's a couple of cases why, where that happens, and it usually happens because of damp ammunition. If you think about what they're using in most cases for executions, and the IRA, when they do decide to leave the body on the, the roadside, this is actually an imitation of something that the British had done during the First World War. The British on the Western Front shot a lot of civilians as spies, um, and uh, uh, particularly Belgian civilians. Um, again, something that doesn't make it into the British First World War history books because it tarnishes the reputation of the heroic British army. Um, but the British would shoot suspected spies and leave their bodies lying on a roadside or tied up to a tree with a label on it, spy. And the IRA, and again, many of them in the 1920s were British Army veterans of the First World War. Tom Barry is the most obvious one that, that springs to mind, but Emmett Dalton and other people as well. When they carried out executions, they would line up a number of men as a firing squad, trying to present themselves as an army, following proper military practice, and would then open fire. And part of the reason why firing squads were used was to prevent any one person having the, the moral blame for doing the, the killing. When the IRA were shooting, often they were using shotguns or they were using 0.455 um, Webley and Scott revolvers. These would often be hidden in the Irish countryside in sheds, buried underground and so on. Once the gunpowder actually gets damp, it gets less effective. It has less kick. So in some cases there are, um, the case you're probably thinking of is Tom O'Sullivan in, in Ratmore, who's who's shot by the IRA. In that case, they decide to, um, he's a civilian. They decide he's suspected of being a, a British spy. They leave his body on the roadside at a place called Ratmore. It's just in the border between Cork and Kerry. And their plan there is for the RIC and the Black and Tans to come along to recover the body and then they would ambush them. So they're waiting. The British Crown Forces apparently get wind of, of what's happening. They don't turn up for the ambush. But a few hours in, the IRA guys turn around and go, where's the body gone? And he wasn't dead. He had actually crawled off the roadside and into the ditch. So they had to finish him off and 
put his body back onto the road again. And an interesting one on that one is it's it was often suggested um, that Tom Sullivan had been a member of the travelling community in in Ireland, and that's something I think I've I've disproved in the uh, in the book. There are no contemporary accounts saying that he's he's a traveller. Um, I don't know where this idea has come from. The uh, revisionist school of history, as we call them here, what we see is the the pro pro uh, pro British side of of things will often say that oh the IRA exploited the intelligence war in the 1920s to execute um, Protestants in the South or to execute travellers or or homosexuals or anyone else who was seen to be breaking Catholic moral norms and that's just nonsense. Um, for my PhD, I looked into that and I found that three quarters of those executed by the IRA as alleged spies during that period were actually Roman Catholics. So the thing I would come to in this book uh, on the disappeared is uh, that the if there is a skeleton in the IRA's closet from the 1920s, it's not any form of sectarianism or social prejudice in the War of Independence in the South. It is the number of people who were disappeared. Okay, very interesting. That that placard thing has a, a more modern iteration up in the north. They would sometimes put like a crisp uh, twenty pound note in um in Wisconsin. Yeah. So, yeah, if they were suspected. Um you, you mentioned there about reprisals and um revenge by, by British forces. Um happened plenty, I think. I mean you're you're living in Cork and from Cork, but Barney of Cork being the 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 preeminent example. There was also I, I didn't notice that there's loads of like informational nuggets in the book that aren't even like related to a disappearance, there was a. I didn't know that the last person to die, um, in the War of Independence actually bled out as the clock was, um, as the clock was like like striking midday on the um, on the the truce being signed. It was a a lady in a a lady in Killarney named uh, named Hannah Carey. It was tragic. Yeah, Hannah Carey was a uh, was a hotel maid in Killarney, and um, there had been an IRA attack on British army. Um, uh, British Army officers that morning and assassination really um, and actually it wasn't done by the Kerry IRA in Killarney, it was actually Cork guys who had come down from the hills and just at the last you know, few hours before the ceasefire was due to begin saw their opportunity and shot dead this, this British uh, sergeant, I think Sergeant Mears was his name but the British went wild in, in reprisal for this and a group of RIC constables and, and black and tans, again, some of them Irish, not all of these guys were, were English, raced through what is, I think it's it's Main Street or a High Street in Killarney and the Imperial Hotel was there. The hotel is still trading today. And this lady was a, um, a, a chambermaid and she was a cleaner in the hotel really and she was outside and she was beating rugs to get the, the dust out of them. Again, no vacuum cleaners at the time. And they just drove through the streets firing wildly and they shot her dead and she died um, 10 minutes before the uh, ceasefire began at noon on the 11th of July 1921. Uh, so she would officially be the last victim of the War of Independence. The British, of course, tried to cover it up. They tried to claim that the IRA had shot her in a crossfire. But when you look at it, the two attacks are, are two hours apart. We can identify the... Uh, the actual black and tan who was who was uh, firing the uh, the shot, and if you're interested in that particular killing, I do have uh, another book called Truce, Murder, Myth, and the Last Days of the Irish War of Independence, and that killing and a lot of the data I have on the shooting of spies and the allegations of anti-Protestant sectarianism are included in that book. Very interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a look. Um, we we mentioned there about um about uh, certain IRA members um having been in the British Army and then using that knowledge um and tactics and so on to to pass on to their men um to Tom Barry of course being being the best example there was um there was one or two there in the in the book where ex British soldiers who were now living in Ireland and retired and stuff they were um targeted because they they refused to to do this kind of cross pollination of, of like military knowledge and experience. I, I, I found that kind of that big grudgery um, kind of interesting as a, as a reason to kill, you know, in, in, in some, I don't think it was big grudgery as such. I think it was their, their actions. Um, so for example, if you look at Cork city and there's been great work done there by John Borgonovo and obviously Cork would be the, the crucible of the, the war of independence, you know, the most killings are happening there far more, ex-soldiers were killed by the British Crown Forces in Cork than were killed by the IRA. 
If you go to Limerick City, the same thing happens again, um, far more, and indeed in County Limerick as a whole. And again, Tom Toomey and John O'Callaghan have great books in that. The British are killing far more civilian ex-soldiers than the IRA are, but nobody from the Irish Times or from Trinity College ever comes along and go, well, the British were clearly prejudiced against former British servicemen. Um, it's more your, your activities. So something like if a soldier comes back and they're perceived to be very loyalist and they might be asked for money for the IRA arms fund and they refuse or something, that's just they're, they're, they're a loyalist. But if they're seen to be hanging out with serving members of the British Crown Forces, then you're worried that there is intelligence and local information being traded. And if we take one example, there's a guy called Thomas Kirby uh, from Golden in, uh, in County Tipperary in the Irish Midlands. And Thomas Kirby was a British Army veteran who had joined twice. So he joined in 1898 and he had joined again in 1916. And both of these years are significant because 1898 is the centenary of the 1798 rebellion. There's a lot of very strong Republican feeling. And 1916, of course, he enlists after the 1916 rising when Republican feeling has peaked again. And on both occasions, he's kicked out of the British Army for being mentally unsound. And this is something that comes up um, later. It often happens in, let's say, some of the, the troubles, um, disappearances in the north where it appears the British Army Intelligence and in some cases RUC Special Branch were willing to exploit people with vulnerabilities, addictions, mental health issues and use them for their own purposes and then cast them away and didn't give them protection when it was needed. But if we return to Thomas Kirby, he, uh, when the British, it's the East Lancashire Regiment, I think. Uh, no, it's not the East Lancashire's. Um, anyway, when the British Army um, arrive in his area, um, he basically volunteers um, to serve with them. I think it's the Lincolnshire Regiment. And um, he's not serving with them in an official capacity, but he's doing some work called what the British and their official records call an identifier. Now, a spy or an informer is somebody who gives information. An informer probably hears bits of information in the pub, maybe writes it down in a letter, posts it in. A spy is somebody who actually goes out listens at windows, gathers information, follows people. But again, you know, meets someone, maybe gives that information and stays in the background for their self-preservation as much as they can. An identifier is different. An identifier is somebody who's not just giving information, but is willing to go out with these British Army soldiers from Lincolnshire. Now, bear in mind, these guys would never have been in Tipperary before, didn't know the Irish countryside, Irish culture, Irish customs. And basically, people like Thomas Kirby would dress up as a disguise in British Army uniform so they would fit in with everyone else, would go out and would then say, OK, take the next left here. Um, that's O'Rourke's house. Burn him out. He's a terrible Fenian. Go right. That's the um, McGrath house. They're OK. They're loyalists. They're ex-soldiers. And if we go down to the pub now, Seamus usually drinks there on Friday and he's the local quartermaster. And if we see him, I'll pick him out for you because you don't have a photo of him. So that's the work that an identifier does. Thomas Kirby is 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 seen and is caught doing this work by the uh, Tipperary, um, I think it's the third Tipperary Brigade of the IRA. Uh, he is abducted when he goes to spend the, the money he's getting in the, the pub. It's noticed that he's getting way more money, presumably payment from the British Army, than he could have been getting off his British Army pension. He's taken up a hillside in, in Tipperary. He is executed and he is buried in a shallow grave. Now, he remained in that grave until 1990. So 89 or what? how many years after the, the conflict ended? Um, 1990, he's, he's there until. And what happened is there was a local old IRA veteran, if we can call him that, who was dying. And his dying wish was he expressed on his deathbed that Thomas Kirby's body be dug up and given a Christian burial. Local people went out, started excavating at the alleged burial site, found some rosary beads in the British Army button, called in the Gardaí. The Gardaí then called the state pathologist at the time, Dr. John Harbison, and the body was fairly well preserved in the bog. He actually carried out uh, an autopsy and he found the body of a man uh, who was dressed in a makeshift British Army uniform, British Army cap, Lincolnshire Regiment cap badge, British Army great coat. And all this, again, fits with the information we have that Kirby was uh, an identifier. But what was interesting in, in Harbison's autopsy was, and that's how well preserved the body was decades later, that um, 
the bullet holes in his back uh, hadn't gone through his great coat. So it appears that he was actually executed while digging his grave and the great coat was put on him after death. Um, so in that case, like if you tie that in with what I had about private um, uh, uh, private George, George Duff Chalmers, um, in some cases, we know exactly where these bodies are buried. The local knowledge is there, but the authorities do not want to dig them up unless they're forced by circumstances to do so. Interesting. That actually provides a like a perfect segue into into the next thing I was going to ask you. Um, um, there was a, there was two men up in the north. We'll we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the troubles now. Seamus Wright and Kevin McKee, and one of their roles as uh, these so called Freds for the the MRF was actually doing something like like what you said there. They would ride around. Um, in the Saracens, they would look out the thing and say, "That's this person, that's that, yeah, etc." Um, interesting. That was um, Corby was like, like, uh, yeah, those, Earth. those, those tactics are are exactly the same. Um, and they they happen with um, Kitson does them with the Mau Mau in in Kenya, but these have been learned and developed in Ireland in the nineteen twenties. Um, so for example, um, Henry Beatrum Mills is a Protestant loyalist from, from County Clare. Himself and his wife are targeted by the IRA's alleged spies. Um, they're shot at, but never actually killed. They managed to get away. This would be in 1921. I found compensation papers while I was doing my PhD that Mills had put in. He was from Ennis in, in County Clare. And he said, I went out with the British Army in their lorries and I peeked through the armoured car, the little slit the driver had, and I would identify people. Um, William Bill Shields, who is a guy who infiltrates the, the IRA a bit like um, Rice and, and, and McKee, um, he's in an IRA flying column, he betrays them, this nearly results in Liam Lynch, the, the IRA leader from Cork, being captured, but he gets away at the last second. He is brought around in disguise as an identifier, he's put into the local pub in, in uh, NAD in North Cork, and he's basically, the windows are closed so that there's just a tiny little, or the curtains are closed, he's peeking out through it, and all the local people are arrested and marched by the window and he's inside picking out who is is who and even there is an allegation with Jean McConville that um she was brought down to British Army barracks she was behind a, a sheet and again we can go into detail in all those um disappearances in a minute but that, that the uh, uh allegedly local people recognized her by an unusual pair of uh, slippers she was wearing that were peeking out underneath that's that's one story but again with the McConville thing it's it's very contested Right. Um interesting. The the McKee and Wright case, um, it's it's a very it's a fascinating kind of Venn diagram between um you have the involvement of Brendan Hughes, lit legendary IRA figure, the Price sisters, um also like like we said, the the MRF. Um the MRF, th these two were actually I think they're the only two threads that we that we can we can like say for sure. Yeah. Or, um yeah, you, you you might go into that case first. It's very interesting. Sure. So just to say, when the uh, troubles start in the north in um, in 69, right up until about 72, 73, the provisional IRA and in some cases the officials um, are copying in a lot of ways the tactics of the War of Independence when it comes to dealing with alleged spies and informers. So things are happening like tarring and feathering. If they don't think somebody's crime is bad enough to kill them, they tar them, they feather them. That was done in the War of Independence. Um, chopping off of, of women's hair for going out with British soldiers. Again, that's a tactic of oh, the oh, War of Independence and later the, the French resistance. And right up until 73, the um, provisionals are actually labelling bodies with cards that say spy, tout. Um, later, they tend to drop that. And what they do is they put up graffiti in an area which identifies somebody. And later still, let's say by the 1980s, they're not putting cards in the body Graffiti is still being used, but in those cases, they will tape record the alleged confessions of those who are disappeared or those who are shot at spies. Now, how reliable those are and how much torture is involved, it's not a regular court of law. Um, you know, we don't know the conditions that those were, were given in, so they're, they're probably useless as any historical um, document. Um, but what happens, and it, it I should say the difference between the old IRA disappearing people and the, the provisionals, apart from the scale, is that chiefly when the old IRA of the War of Independence disappear people, it's capture British Army soldiers, it's capture black and tans, it's civilians they suspect of spying. 
not a single IRA volunteer is um, disappeared during the War of Independence for spying. And only of the 200 people who were shot as spying, only three of them are serving or former IRA volunteers. So they were much more reluctant to shoot them in, in the, the 20s. However, by the 1970s, it's the other way around. You're talking about the majority of people being disappeared by the IRA being IRA volunteers who were suspected of having turned like Wright and McKee, who will come to in a minute, or occasionally civilians like um, Jean uh, McConville, who were alleged to be spies. And again, I can never say 100 percent. It's very difficult to tell in these circumstances. And there's only one case where there is a, a serving member of the British Crown Forces disappeared, and that's Captain Robert Nyrak. The first person to be disappeared in the north is in June of 1972. That's a guy called um, Joe Linsky. He is from Harrogate Street in Belfast. He had been a, a Cistercian monk. He had come back to Belfast, having given up on the religious life. He became an IRA volunteer. And then he started uh, an affair with a fellow IRA volunteer, uh, with, with a fellow IRA volunteer's wife. And Linsky basically wanted his, his love rival out of the way. He sent IRA volunteers under his command um, to assassinate this guy. Now, they did not know the reason why they'd been told to shoot this guy, but the shooting was, was bungled. The provisional IRA then, again, this is 1972, there was a feud going on with the, uh, or there was a feuding with the official IRA because of the, the, the split at the time, the political split. And the provisionals go to hit back. They shoot up a... Um, uh, an official IRA uh, drinking club, the the Cracked Cup on um, on the Falls Road in Belfast, and a civilian called Dennis Mackin is killed. Now, eventually, people figure out what's happening and that Linsky is responsible for this, and they have him um, taken away down south and disappeared because this resulted in a civilian being killed. It almost called, reopens the feud between the officials and the provisionals, and he's killed by um, he's taken away down south. And you have um, he's basically his body is uh, is still is still missing. And Dolores Price talks about that. She was involved in that as well as um, uh, as well as um, uh, as Brendan the Dark Hughes. You said, um, yeah. And what happens then if we move on to Wright and McKee? Um, in the case of Linsky, I think it's very much it, it was an embarrassment what happened. It served a purpose to disappear him, and then this begins. Um, the process of, of disappearing in the, the north, really. Um, Seamus Wright was a married man living in, in Bombay Street in, uh, in Belfast. He was a member of D Company, 2nd Battalion, the Provisional IRA. And he's arrested at his home on the, uh, on the 7th of February 1972, and he's taken to Palace Barracks. Um, now, he kind of disappears from there. He's in contact with his wife, but very sporadically. She's getting postcards from him and they're coming from Carrick Fergus and then from places in England and then from places in, in Birmingham and she said what are you doing he said oh I, I got picked up I have I've to go on the run I'm hiding out from the the British I'm hiding in Birmingham I'm working tarmac in driveways and he phones every so often from phone boxes in in England and his wife says she wants to meet him so she gets a flight over to Birmingham uh, she meets him in a very sparsely furnished flat and there's a guy there who uh who Seamus Wright identifies as Colin an SAS man and it's clear now what's happening he's working for the British and he had actually been in the palace um barracks in Belfast the whole time but to keep up the charade the British had been flying him out to England to send postcards or make phone calls in case anyone was was monitoring this and there's a great um charity called um paper trail in the north who do research into this and they actually found this is this is a rare thing to have but they found a document and um, that actually proves what what had happened from a british army um patrol log and it's just three sentences i'll read it very quickly it's on page 273 of the book right seamus 5th of february 1972 arrested by ruc and identified as volunteer in the provisional ira 6th of february 1972 Two recruited into the MRF, Military Reaction Force, Mobile Reaction Force, whatever. We know it's a, a specialist British Army unit. 29th of March, discharged as unsatisfactory for further MRF use, taken to Birmingham and left there 
being paid a total of two hundred and eighty five pounds. So something like that have is you know a very and it's from the British Army a very rare document. But it's just at the end of March it ties in with what we know. He returns to Belfast. He's trying to resume a normal wife a uh, life with his wife. Presumably he's he's homesick and a provisional IRA abduct him and interrogate him. And basically he breaks under interrogation and he reveals what's happening, that he has been recruited into the MRF and that they have specific barracks and places they use in uh, in Belfast. And he's the person as well who says that they, they had a, a team of locals who have been turned called Freds. And the name Fred, where it comes from, it's from a, a comic book strip at the time. Um, Fred Bassett was in the, the newspaper. So that's where it seems to come from. And again, this thing seems to be largely based around the palace barracks. And these guys who are identifiers are working for them. Again, like Thomas Kirby in the 1920s, sometimes they live and stay in the barracks. Uh, and he's actually right because he has confessed everything is released briefly. But he's also identified um, Kevin McKee a fellow IRA volunteer, as having been turned. Uh, McKee is from Moynard, uh, the Moynard area of Belfast. It's often said that he was related to um, a leading provisional IRA figure in Belfast with the same surname. I don't actually think that's uh, that's accurate. Um, but McKee seems to have been thought of this all as a bit of an adventure. Uh, and uh, basically he liked wearing like a shoulder holster with a pistol the British gave him in it, you know, to feel, I don't know, was he thought he was James Bond or a, a kind of big man or something. But again, on page uh, 274 of the book, I have um, evidence that was uncovered um, uh, from the watchkeeper's log uh, kept by the, the Scottish borders. And again, if it's four or five lines, I can read it. Um, arrest 2250. Sergeant McVeigh lifted two men from the street. Kevin McKee, 50, Glenina Park, and he mentions uh, another man from the Bally Murphy Road. They were both arrested. Kevin McKee gave information to search 57 West Rock Drive. Find 007, so seven minutes after midnight. Um, CS 37 went to search and found one Garand M1 rifle, one Lee Enfield .303 Mark IV rifle. Two M1 carbine rifles, one 38 revolver, nine assorted rifle magazines. So basically, McKee has given away uh, an IRA arms dump. And again, we have the, the documentation from the British Army, which says that, which is, is very rare. In other cases, like G. McConville, we don't have um, paperwork um, like that. But once McKee is arrested by the provisional IRA in September of 1972, um, he basically tries to deny everything at first, but he has this shoulder holster. All this has been described by Seamus Wright. It ties in. Wright has picked up again. They give the information that leads to the attack on the intelligence gathering operation, the Foursquare Laundry. I know you covered that in the podcast previously in the Kipson, Kitson's War episode, so I won't go into that uh, Again, there's another place, the Gemini Rooms, a sauna, which was being used as a brothel to gather information. That's attacked as well. And they were taken to um, Cottlestown Bog in um, in County Meath. They were both, um, by the provisional IRA, they were both executed together, buried in the same grave. And their bodies were excavated, were, were dug up in 2015 by the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains. And that is the the team of researchers, forensic archaeologists, former police, etc. It's it's independent, set up in 1998 to recover the bodies of those disappeared who hadn't been found by the time of the Good Friday Agreement. And in some cases like that of, of um, let's say, uh, Joe Linsky or Robert Nyrak, they're actually still searching for those bodies. Um, interesting that um, I believe Seamus Wright uh, thought that his life would be spared, um, given that he gave up another Fred um, and apparently, you you mentioned the book there. Uh, apparently, Brendan Hughes, the the decision which wasn't his to um to actually to actually finish them. Um... Yeah, it's 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 very controversial, and I know I've been told stuff um by other former leading provisionals that I couldn't put in the book for legal reasons, and I'm not telling you, <laughs> your listeners, your viewers, for legal reasons. Um, but Brendan. The dark use we can talk about because he is um he's uh, he's dead obviously um he said this was a very controversial thing and he said that he was not the only leading provisional who was unhappy 
um, unhappy with this and that there were serious arguments and debates over disappearing people, particularly in the case of Wright and McKee. And I think particularly in Wright's case, because Wright had um, given all the information he had, had exposed McKee as well, had exposed the Foursquare laundries and that whole intelligence gathering operation. And it was felt by Hughes or so he claimed um, that, you know, we had given him assurances, we had promised him nothing would happen. And even when they were taken down south, apparently they weren't executed straight away. Um, the IRA guys who were guarding them felt a lot of sympathy for them and um, uh, basically were unwilling to execute them. And volunteers of the provisional IRA from Belfast had to come down and do the uh, the grim deed itself, or so the, the accounts tell us anyway. Um, okay, so we'll we'll, we'll get on to um, Conville after this one. Um, I just wanted to split it up, given um, that Wright and McKee were disappeared, um, broadly speaking, for, for helping the British. Um, same thing um, eventually with McConville. But uh, a, a very, a very interesting, in fact, one of the most bizarre little kind of like sub stories from the, the Troubles is, uh, is Robert Nyrak. So much mystery and rumour as to what he was or wasn't involved with. There's those who allege he was there on the night Miami show band. Um, I interviewed Stephen Travers. He believes that it doesn't have any proof or anything. Didn't see him, but does believe it. And um, there are those who allege um, that he was involved in the Dublin Monaghan bombing. Again, we we don't know, so we 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 can't prove it. The way he uh, the way he eventually met his end was one of these like like I said, just absolutely bizarre um, things. Have you ever seen that show, uh, Impractical Jokers? You know I haven't. Show? No. It's one they, they they have a team of comedians and they put an earpiece in one guy and they they send him okay go over to that fella and tell him this tell him that this sounds like some messed up episode where they say go into a South Armagh pub and try to pass yourself off as some of mm. Belfast and see and see what happens. Hmm. Well, Nyrak's problem, as far as I can see, and again, I'm not a military veteran, I'm not <laughs> a specialist intelligence analyst, I'm just a, a historian. <laughs> historian, sorry. Um. Nyrak seems to have had huge overconfidence in his own abilities. He was a very skilled um, boxer. He was clearly a very intelligent man. Um, but being intelligent doesn't always mean that you're necessarily clever or, or streetwise. Um, he was a Catholic and he overestimated the extent to which the conflict in the North was a religious divide rather than a colonial, political, military revolutionary struggle um he had befriended children who came who were from an irish catholic background a very wealthy business background who used to have a summer house in spiddle in galway and nyrak had visited there would have been more familiar with things like the irish language irish customs and obviously cultural catholicism than the average british um intelligence officer but he really um he let that confidence lead him away. This is my feeling. Uh, he used to do things like go out on patrol um, in uh, British Army uniform in an area. And then he would turn up doing undercover work in another village eight to ten miles away. And I mean, people have cars at this stage. This is 1977 when he's killed. You know, it doesn't mean that somebody hasn't gone to the big town to do their shopping. Nyrak as well strikes me as having been a bit of a, a fantasist. Like I have a photograph in the book uh, that shows Robert Nyrak in his British Army uh, um, jacket, wielding a Thompson machine gun and wearing a black beret with an Easter lily pinned to it. And apparently sometimes he went on patrol like this. And it's like he's cosplaying or LARPing as a member of the provisional IRA, like certainly a Thompson machine gun and a black beret with an Easter lily on it. These are not um, standard British Army issue. As to the Miami show band thing, there are allegations of other killings that he was involved in. Now, I talk to people who have researched this, who will be uh, researched it in more depth than I have. And basically, I paired back a lot of what I said about Robert Nyrak as, uh, as a result. They've said that claims about his involvement in in different killings have been exaggerated. However, one part that I definitely left in is the um, uh, the Miami Shoban massacre in 1975, when uh, it looks like either the Glenan gang or um, British Army intelligence working with um, the UVF, uh, some of whom were also serving in the, the UDR, 
um, pick up Fran O'Toole's Miami show band, very popular band that played both sides during the, the Troubles and basically tried to frame them by putting a bomb into their 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 tour bus. Uh, the bomb explodes prematurely and then the survivors uh, of the band are, um, are machine gunned. And the saxophonist uh, Des McAuley, who was there on the night, says that the orders and the whole operation was being directed by an Englishman with a, a crisp English accent, and he said he later saw a photograph of Nyrak and recognised him. Now, the official investigation says that Robert Nyrak was on leave at the time and would have been in Britain, would not have been there. But I mean, you know, I cannot doubt Des as, as an eyewitness. He was there. I was not. Nyrak eventually goes to the three steps in close to the, 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 the border uh, and um, he there's an Irish rebel band playing at the time. Apparently, he goes there to meet a meet a contact. And um, as soon as he walks into the bar, he makes himself obvious. Now, I don't care how good he thought his accent or his idioms or his knowledge would have been. He makes this fuss and says, oh, I've, I've lost my cigarettes. Someone's stolen my cigarettes. So he goes straight into the bar, draws attention to himself. And then when the band starts singing like Wolf Tone style rebel songs, he insists on getting up on stage and singing. He is announcing himself to the whole bar. And people are suspicious. They're saying something up with his accent. Who's he? He's not from around here. What's he doing here? And a local woman is sent up to dance with him to see if he is armed, if he's wearing a gun in a holster. And eventually what happens is people in the bar grow suspicious of him. I think the initial people, group of people who capture Nyrak are not themselves provisional IRA volunteers. They're just locals who would have been sympathetic. And basically, they, they you know, beat him or wrestle him in the car park. And again, Naira can be a very accomplished boxer, but it's different in a boxing ring to fighting seven people or however many in a bar fight. He's bundled away. He's taken south of the border and he is um, he's executed and he's buried in a shallow grave. Now, what seems to happen is that in the security forces and Gardaí response to this, um, uh, I should say that when he's executed, it's provisional IRA volunteers who are actually called to get a gun and to, to do the job. And apparently leader, leading provisionals were very angry at the time that he was executed in the night instead of being held and interrogated. So it's not a, a great operation from a provisional IRA standpoint either. What happens is that um, as the arrests begin, somebody who was involved in the killing appears to worry that, oh, they're going to sing like a, a tree full of canaries. So they go out on their own or with some other assistance, they exhume Nyrak's body and it's reburied at another location. And when the Gardaí search the area where they've been told Nyrak is buried, they find a clump of hair, they find um, some shell casings, and I think they find Nyrak's holster. Now, uh, Nyrak's body is, uh, is still missing. And um, I think that regardless of whether he was involved in the Miami show band massacre or anything else, you know, officially, according to the Geneva Convention, when a conflict ends, you return the uh, you return the bodies and his body is still missing and the ICLVR are still seeking information. One thing that the ICLVR, the Commission for the Location of Victims Remains, have said is that the story that is out there, the propaganda story that Nyrak's body was destroyed in a meat grinder in a local meat rendering factory is absolutely nonsense. It does not have any foundation. In fact, that story, as far as I can see, is first brought up by a guy called Eamon Collins, who was um, uh, an informer in the provisional IRA who later uh, wrote a book called Killing Rage. As far as I can see, that's the first time that story turns up. And it appears to be based on a story from the 1920s. There's two RIC, long story short, I'll condense it. There's two RIC constables or black and tans in Tralee, uh, Bright and Waters. Waters is an Irishman, Bright is a, an Englishman. They're abducted one night while out courting local girls. They're executed and their bodies are buried um, in Slobland at, uh, at Blennerville, just outside Tralee. We know this from IRA accounts. That's where the bodies are buried. The British, however, come up with this propaganda story that they have been killed by being thrown alive into a furnace and their bodies were destroyed. And as far as I can see, that is the origin of the, the Nyrak meat grinder um, story, which has been totally um, discredited at this stage. Interesting, interesting. Um, God above that, I, I always, uh, every now and again, like like I do think, I do think about that Nyrak thing, like, like, like what was in his head? Um, well, I suppose um, war does funny people, funny things to people. And in order to gather intelligence, you need to put yourself at risk to a certain extent. I found 
British Army officers acting the same way in the 1920s. You have a guy called, um, oh, what's his name? He is with the Ox and Bucks uh, Light Infantry. He's their intelligence officer, Colonel J.B. Jarvis in Limerick. And he dresses up in, um, in civilian clothes goes out into the countryside carrying two carrier pigeons and disappears for two weeks. And the local RIC are going, this guy's nuts, he'll be killed. East Clare at the time would have been like South Armagh in the 70s. And a week later, they hear from him. A carrier pigeon arrives back with a note tied to its leg. And the note says, still going strong, have eaten the other pigeon. <laughs> and amazingly, the guy arrives back and he's an intelligence officer and he's taking risks. Now, personally, I think he got some British soldiers killed in the area he was working in but again that's in some of my previous books if people are interested in that case um yeah the god the the accent thing i mean even the, the fact the fact that he had gone to galway so many times it would nearly make you think that he'd be he'd have been way better off even pretending he was from galway because at least people from south apparently America, apparently he did that him. once apparently he did that once and he was caught out um he he used to say that he was Danny Macerlain from Belfast, and his Belfast accent was so hokey. There used to be a Belfast um, bread company at the time called Macerlain's, and in the three steps in, somebody said, "What did he say? His name was Macerlain. He got that name off of a loaf of bread." Um, but apparently, on one occasion, um, Nyrak had was asked, "Where are you from?" And he said, "Oh, I'm from Belfast." And he said, oh, what part of Belfast? Well, actually, my family moved to Belfast originally. We're from Spittle. And um, he said, all oh, right, I know people from Spiddle. I have relatives in Spiddle. Where are you from in Spiddle, did you say? And he said, oh, do you know, when you drive out the road there towards Barna, the last house there, it's painted green on whatever side of the road. He said, that's my place. And this guy went, oh, hang on. Oh, you're not that family at all. And Nyrak closed off the conversation and, and disappeared. But he was taking a lot of a lot of risks. That's that's a story not in the book, but that's a story I picked up in, um, in Connemara itself. Um, so interesting, interesting. And um, yeah, it, it does it does seem from from what you read about him generally that he was kind of a wild man, and he he he'd be that type to just kind of fucking do something without thinking. And to, to be honest with you, I always think that if he had the if he had the confidence to go into such a hostile area, a, a pub in such in such an area, and do the accent, he probably would have have to have gotten away with it once before, unless unless he just. Mm. Unless it was his first uh, first try, which which I wouldn't believe, but but yeah, well, I suppose you can only chance your luck so many times before it runs out. Very true, and yeah, p- people would have to be bloody stupid for um to to think a guy from like a a good background in England to, to the impression that he would do of a, of a Belfast man would be laughable, probably. Um, okay, um, we'll move on to uh, we'll move on to Gene McConville. Um, one of the best books, in my opinion, ever written on the the troubles, and definitely the most. Uh, successful, especially of the the recent ones, is uh, say nothing. Um, it goes into it goes into all sorts of things, including Wright and McKee and the the Freds and the MRF. Um, but it centers around the story of of Jean McConville. Um, like so many others, um, she at least in, accused of being an informant, but but due to the fact that she's a woman, um, she did get like uh, a different course of uh, a course of events. Before, before ultimately being being taken out for for being uh, suspected. Well, yeah, Pat Patrick Braddon Keith's book, um, uh, say nothing is a great book, and I'd I'd recommend it to your listeners. Obviously, I'm hoping they'll buy my book first. <laughs> but um, uh, basically, Jean McConville is, I suppose, her story is very well known because she is a very high profile woman, um, who has a lot of children who's killed in the north. Now, we should say in the 1920s, officially there was an IRA general order against executing women. However, the IRA of the 1920s did execute women and did disappear women as well. Um, so they execute um, a woman called Bridget Noble, who is uh, alleged to be a spy in uh, out near Bantry in West Cork, and her body has disappeared and has not been recovered. And they also execute a woman called um, Mary uh, Lindsay, who is definitely gave information on at least one occasion to the uh, the British Army, and that's that's acknowledged. And her body has never been recovered. And there's also a woman in Monaghan, Kate Carroll, um, who is um, uh, killed in Monaghan for giving information to the RIC. And she was shot, and her body was left on the roadside. So um, Michael Collins, uh, as an IRA leader, had far more women executed and disappeared 
than Martin McGuinness's buddies might have done uh, 50 years later. Um, but to come to, to McConville, um, she's Jean McConville. Her maiden name is Jean Murray. She's originally from East Belfast. She marries a Catholic uh, ex-soldier called uh, Arthur McConville, ex-British Army soldier. Now, due to a theological thing we won't go into here, there's something called the Nate Mera Decree. And this is the Catholic Church in 1911 brings this in and says, if a car uh, Catholic is entering a mixed marriage, their spouse must convert and promise to raise the children as Catholics. And this is what Jean McConville does. And I think it's interesting that when people talk about the killing of Jean McConville, they always say, oh, Jean McConville, she was a Protestant woman who, well, she had been raised Protestant, but she had converted. And according to some family accounts I found and included in the book, she took that conversion quite seriously. And she used to go across Belfast to the Clonard Monastery to attend religious instruction classes. It wasn't just the thing of signing the form, which I know some people in mixed marriages have told me they signed the form and never thought about it again. Um, and actually, the Nate Tamara decree doesn't doesn't force the um, the person of the other religion to actually convert. It just forces them to give a commitment to raise the children as as Catholics. But what happens is they settle in, in East Belfast in a place called Beersbridge Road. Um, in uh, nineteen sixty nine, they're forced out because of uh, uh, basically rising sectarian tensions. Catholics are being put out, so her husband is is. Um, forced out first and she's given an ultimatum again this is information in the book that I found a family member um, quoting that she'd been given the option that if she agreed to raise the children Protestant she would be allowed to remain there with them and she refused so the family resettled in um, West Belfast in um, the Divis Flats uh, area I think it's the St Jude's uh, part of the Divis Flats um, that would have been 1969. Shortly afterwards, in 1972, her husband dies of cancer. So that leaves her a widowed mother with 10 very young children. And she's trying to cope with this in, you know, the Divis Flats, as it used to be known, the planet of the Earps, the INLA, official IRA were very active there. It's in the middle of a, a war zone. The British Army eventually, of course, move in and take over the top of the flat complex. And she appears to have been having difficulty coping with all this stress. Now, at the same time, there are stories, and again, some of these are contested, that she may have been, if not sympathetic to the British, at least hostile to the IRA. So one story from the McConville family is that their mother was not a, a an informer, but she'd been targeted because there had been a gun battle and a British soldier had been wounded and she brought him out a drink of water. And that the graffiti soldier lover out then appears on the outside of the McConville's flat. Now, there's another local account by a Republican who disputes that and said, actually, that graffiti was about my sister. And it was a British soldier that was hit in the head with the brick and she brought him out water. And that was about her. And in the investigations by Nula O'Lone into the McConville case, Case, she said that there was no record of a gun battle at that part of Divis Flats before um, uh, before McConville's disappearance. So it's tough to know which of those stories is true and, and what's accurate. This is the, the fog of war. Um, one thing I think that, that that is admitted by the family is that she wouldn't take part in the chain. And what the chain was when the British Army would come and search a place, um, the women or the family members in the homes would take, if they were hiding guns or equipment or documents for the IRA, would take these, pass them out the window to the next flat until the British Army were gone. And they could kind of pass them around the outside of the buildings and, and get them to safety. She wouldn't take take part in that. Now, according to Brendan Hughes' account, and we don't know how biased he is, but according to Brendan Hughes, he says that it was identified that she was giving information and that she had a radio handset from the British Army. Um, and that this is how she was communicating with them. Now, in response to that claim, the British Army have said, we never use that type of radio in Northern Ireland. But then, of course, a few years ago, somebody produced a photograph of a British soldier in the Divis Flats using that exact model of radio. Um, so um, what happens is that on the 29th of November, 1972, and again, this this is established, Jean McConville is, um, is assaulted. I think she's coming home from, um, from uh, uh, Bingo. And she's basically warned not to be giving information to um, the uh, the British forces. Now, according to Hugh's account, and again, the family would 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 dispute this and say that she was targeted for for other reasons. But according to Hugh's account, they raided her her flat. They they found the radio. They warned her not to inform, or she would be she would be shot. Now, uh, what happened? 
happens is on the 7th of December 1972, she is abducted from her flat. Again, the Republican version of things is that um, she's caught. She has a radio. Again, family would dispute this and say it's it's done for, for other reasons. She's taken away south of the border. She's executed at a place called Shelling Hill Beach in, uh, in County Louth, and her body is buried there. Now, post-1998, there had been, once the ceasefire came in, uh, a long many long years of campaigning by the McConville family to have her body excavated and returned. Members of the provisional IRA did identify an area that they thought she had been buried in. And you think about it, you bury a body in the dead of night, you know, 25 years ago, you come back, the tree you might have used as a marker is gone, the road layout has changed. The area that the provisional IRA had identified where her body was buried was right beside within a few metres of the area where the body was eventually um, uh, uncovered by accident during a, a sandstorm. And I think it's it's generally accepted by the ICLVR that there was no deliberate attempt by the provisionals to um, to deceive them. But what happens in that case is you're talking about um, the legislation set up about finding these bodies in 1998 is that if... Um, if the body is found as a result of information given, there can be no forensic tests, there can be no ballistics done on anything from the grave. But because McConville's body was found by accident, that legal loophole does not apply. Therefore, there have been attempts to prosecute people or at least to arrest and charge people as a um, as a result of that find. Uh, but to date, no uh, no prosecutions have been made successfully and with the legacy legislation that's coming in in may it now looks unlikely that will happen right um th thank you very much Paul, for joining me um for for sharing the kind of preview into the book obviously the the book goes into way way more detail about the cases we spoke about and and just way more cases uh generally speaking and um, any uh, any kind of final uh, parting words or, or anything you'd, you'd like to tell us about the book that you didn't get to mention yeah, I just mentioned maybe one or two other cases just for me, uh, to, to round it out a bit, and I can do this in, in two or three minutes. Um, in some cases, the same areas are being used 50 years apart to actually um, to hide bodies by different incarnations of the IRA. So, for example, there is a spy for the Black and Tans called Joseph Gibbs, who's disappeared by the IRA in, in Monaghan in January of 1920. And he's buried at a place called um, T. Davnet. Um, it's a hillside in Monaghan. And it's actually the same area where Columba McVeigh, who's another guy we didn't get to mention, is buried. And Columba's body is still being dug for. But it's amazing that you have two disappearances in this one tiny area, 50 years apart. Um, we mentioned Nyrak. Um, we should say, and we mentioned Jean McConville there. We should say that there is a woman disappeared by the British, and that is Margaret Perry. In to cut a long story short, in 1992, she was from uh, she was a Catholic from Portadown. She was going out with a guy called Gregory Burns. Gregory Burns had infiltrated the IRA on behalf of the British Army. Um, he was a married man. She was having a, a relationship with him. And when things went south in that relationship, she basically knew he was a British agent, threatened to inform uh, or the IRA about him. And um, he basically lured her to Mulletmore in uh, in County Sligo, uh, the same place where um, Lord Mountbatten is later assassinated. But the um, the uh, this guy, uh, Gregory Burns, and two other guys who were working for British intelligence in the IRA uh, murdered Margaret Perry and buried her body there in a grave. And it's only when the IRA identified them as British agents and executed them that her body was actually dug up and um, and recovered. And one other case I'd, I'd mentioned in the book is um, uh, Brian McDermott. Who's Brian McDermott? Well, in 1973, he was a, a young boy from East Belfast who disappeared and his body was found several weeks later. And this is grimmer than anything we've talked about so far. Um, he was His body had been mutilated. It had been set on fire. It had been cut into pieces and thrown into a sack in the River Lagan. And that effectively, sometimes people were disappeared by throwing their bodies into rivers. That That is included as a disappearance. Now, what this seems to be linked to, there's a great documentary out at the moment. It hasn't got a, a general release, but it's a guy called Des Henderson. And the documentary is called Lost Boys, Belfast, Missing Children. And he links that to, uh, there's two other 
um, disappearances of, of boys in Belfast at the time. We think of Belfast as a big city. On a global scale, it's small. It's a village. And to have five boys going missing in a small area is, is incredible. In 1969, David Leckie and Jonathan Avon disappear while they're on their way to school. In 1974, Thomas Spence and John Rogers uh, disappear from a bus stop. They're waiting for a, a bus and their bodies have never been being found. And what all this has been linked to by the documentary and by recently uncovered British cabinet documentation is the King Cora Boys Home in East Belfast. And that was being run by loyalist paramilitaries who were in turn working for, it appears, MI5. Chris Moore, the BBC journalist, has done great research on this. And it would appear that that, that place, King Cora, was being used, obviously, by this file network within the um uh the loyalist group and again you're talking about people this isn't conspiracy stuff you're talking about people like william mcgrath who had a conviction for um abusing boys and went to prison for this he was the house master who was in charge of this place and have all these boys disappearing uh around it um it's assumed at this stage that the other four boys like brian mcdermott were uh were murdered and, uh, and disappeared, and that, that would have been done by loyalists and MI5. So the book goes into all sorts of different places. In total, I think for the 20th century, I have 175 different disappearances documented. Um, it's broken down into thematic chapters, as you said, women, spies, British Army officers, tramps, the Troubles is separated from 1798. So even though it's kind of a grim read, it's an easy read in that you can dip in and out of it take it one chapter at a time and you're not missing anything huge in detail. Yeah, I, I was going to say, obviously, um, death and murder and disappearance, it permeates um, significant times of history because there were there were violent times. Um, and this book, um, w w when you read through it, you, you will have read through the most significant um, periods of, of Irish history and learned loads. But, but by no means does it feel like you're reading through a history book, like you're just kind of going chronologically through the to the line it, it, it makes it it makes yeah, it digestible the, the way you broke it up it's 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 not a tome uh i do have an academic background and qualifications but i tried to write the book like the way we're having this chat that just it's it, it you know i've gone through the books you've gone through the books it's just explaining it it's surmising it and it's you know this is what happened this is why it happened it's not a book full of statistics and charts or anything like that it's the stories of people who are disappeared why they were disappeared and where their bodies are and will those bodies ever be recovered or not uh very good if, if you've listened this far you'll you love the book and um, i'll put a link in the the podcast and the and the youtube so so people can get it and um, any plans to make um an audiobook from it I, I know some people are just kind of lazy these days and they won't, won't sit down and read not, a book. not not an audiobook i've gone off into another area of irish politics i have research done and i have a book written um entitled fascism and the far right in ireland 1923 to 2023 so that's looking at things like the the blue shirts, Oswald's British Union of fascists, um, Lord Ha Ha, um, William Joyce, who of course was from Galway and had been an informer for the Black and Tans. It looks at even the Kinkora thing. I go into that again in it. William McGrath, who was running that, was into racist conspiracy theory politics. And um, I take it right up to the modern day. I talk about the Ulster Defence Association um, and the UVF in the north, loyalist paramilitaries working with neo-Nazis in England to get guns into the north. And even the, the current debates and arguments about um, current debates and arguments about um, uh, immigration uh, in the south of Ireland at the moment and in the north. All that is included. Haven't got a publisher yet, but when that book comes out, I will let you know. Interesting. It sounds fascinating. I'd love to have you on again to talk when when it does come out. Super. Thanks very much. Best of luck. Thanks very much, Project.